can get at the end. We can wait. Good morning. I said good morning. Good morning. Oh, there is a crowd here this morning. That's wonderful. I'm glad to see, see that. Uh, my name is uh, Reverend Moore Horton. I'm the senior minister here. and I just love welcoming people to our chapel. We have many new guests this morning. I understand we're getting packets of information to them. Visitors from up north from the uh, Lake Oswego Center. Yeah. And uh, also some people are coming back for the first time in a long while. And some neighbors from the neighborhood are here. So it's <laughs> wonderful. Woodland Chapel is a tremendous inspiration to those of us who come regularly because we really value and teach the importance of being aware of the divine presence of God always both within us and all around us. And we learn, as Ruth so eloquently said in the meditation this morning, as we change our thinking, we change our lives. So if you're interested in changing your life for the better, this is a place to come. Uh, today we have uh, some announcements to cover, and I will do that. You will see them in the, uh, pro on the program. I think it's on, yeah, on the back side of the program, if you'd like to read along. Good news. Thanks to our good work, we've raised enough money to purchase an ex automated external defibrillator, <laughs> AED, and it's out in the library. Next Sunday, we will have an annual meeting of our congregation after the service, as soon as the soup for the soul is done. So about 1 o'clock or so, and we'll have it downstairs. And that is our next Sunday also. Uh, it's good to see those of you who are here who like to make soup and bread and, and sign up for that. That's really good. Well, the donation is $3 per person, but you can put any amount in. I've seen uh, some larger bills go in. Uh, somebody said a $100 bill went in once. Hmm. That's nice. More than once. More nice. than once. Oh, there are people who keep track of that. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we will have a... Um, an introduction to spiritual living meeting, an introduction to the chapel meeting. If you're interested at all in joining the chapel or just want to revisit uh, the key uh, features of our teaching and of our practice here, we'll have that on uh, the last Sunday of this month, February 25th at 1230 in the library. So I would love to have anyone interested visit with us then. Oh, uh, Friday book group is going forward. I understand they're finishing up the biology of belief, and I'll be selecting a new book uh, soon. Is Kathy shaking her head? Yes, so she's coordinating it. Uh, child care is available each Sunday during the service. We have confidential prayer request forms, as you can see, if you look in the front of your pew there. If you're interested in helping out, we're interested in having you help, so let us know. And the Science of Mind magazine is available in the library, two months in one issue. Um, something I wanted to say. I'm sorry, I slipped my mind. Doggone. Um, I'm trying to remember. To, pardon? Oh, yes. Thank you, Michelle. She's very aware. <clears throat> we um, informally adopted a <clears throat> program. We'll continue for a week or two <clears throat> of a... Uh, supporting our parking lot effort, uh, we uh, could write a, a, perhaps a little extra check or drop a few dollars in uh, an envelope there in the market for paving or for parking, and that will be a kind of an extra check Sunday or Sundays, uh, mainly to show the interest of the congregation. I don't, if you've driven in, especially if you walked across the parking lot, did you find it a little less than even? <laughs> you find occasional potholes. They've been filled so many times. Finally, our People who uh, love this chapel and this community have decided to help us pay for a new parking lot. But they want to see we, that we're interested, that we, we want a new parking lot. And one, one way to find out is uh, that people are donating to it and supporting the project. So I, I have an extra check this morning for that, and perhaps others will. Uh, I think anything else that needs to be uh, announced. All right. Oh, board meeting. Let's we do that, don't we? Thank you, Michelle. Michelle's our board president. She keeps, keeps us all on track, especially me. Uh, yes. Anybody can attend the board meeting, um, if you wish. But uh, we will meet in the library at 1 o'clock. Okay. Oh. 
I guess we do may need 12.30. That's right, I'm confused. The 12.30 is a, is a board meeting, but one o'clock is the class for today. That was what I was thinking of. Hmm. Yes, Gail. February birthday. February birthday. Birthdays? Does anyone have a birthday in February? Yay, we got at least one. Well, yeah. How about uh, we sing a little song? All right, here. Brent, let's go. A little birthday song. Happy birthday to you Happy birthday to you Happy birthday to you, Shannon Happy birthday to you <laughs> This is well I think we're, we're due for a congregational song here this morning. We didn't do Yes, we yet. are. All right. Take it away, Darcy. And Brett, yeah. Uh, well, welcome. I would like everybody just to remember that Brett was in the hospital not so very long ago, and he has staged a great recovery, and he's here again. Let's welcome him back to this. <laughs> I want you to know that this is his uh, third outing, and he specifically asked to come back. He wanted... <laughs> He's loving it. It's great. He's doing really, really well, uh, no matter what they said. Um, you all want to stand while we sing our opening song? Yeah. Yeah, yeah come, go ahead and say They do. They do. Okay. You have words in there, but they're very simple. Okay. Um, and I just want to say ahead of time that this is... Um, um, a mantra that what I've learned in my life is that how I start the day helps me uh, keep the day going. And this is one of the songs that helped me do that. It says, day by day, three things I pray to see thee more clearly, to know what the path is, to know what is there for me, to love thee more dearly, to love as I have been loved, and to spread that love always, and then follow thee more nearly, uh, to do what I know is should be done. And so this song, as simple as it is, has such great meaning for me. So I share it with you this morning. Ready, Brent? Go ahead. Go for it, buddy. Yep. There it is. Day by day. See the mark. 
Let's take a few moments and center ourselves with an opening prayer led by our own practitioner, Kathy Prather. Thank you, Reverend Moore. Let's come together, please. Join together with like minds and know that we are in a sanctuary of love. We are in a sanctuary of community. And I know that with like minds, we join. We join our minds, we join our hearts, and we join our aspirations for a new day, for a new heart, for a new joy. And we open ourselves up to that greater expression of life, of beingness, of knowing who we are and what we're about. And as we do this, we become that beacon we become that funnel, we become that expression, and we become easier in our being, and we know what we're about. So I know this for each one here today, that we are each in our right place, doing our right business, and we are in where we should be. And I know this for each of us, and please say with me, and so, so it is. is. And when, will you join with me in the affirmation that's printed in your program? My word carries, carries the, the power, power of my intention. intention. So, so I align, I align myself, myself with, with the, the divine, divine, speak my word, and, and allow my intention to guide my thoughts and, and actions, actions. And, and so, so it, it is. is. Thank you. And now we have a reading from Science of Mind by Catherine Kim. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning. Good morning. Today's message, The Power of Vulnerability, comes from the August, August edition of our Centers for Spiritual Living magazine, Science of Mind. Hafiz says, I wish I could show you, when you are lonely or in darkness, the astounding light of your own being. Our beloved Ernest Holmes says, there is an irresistible potential pressing against everyone for self-expression. If we listen, we shall hear it, not as a voice, but as a feeling, as a divine urge to express. It can be scary to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. When Brene Brown asked people how vulnerability felt, the answer she received most often was, Naked. True? While it's not always easy to be vulnerable, being willing to risk living authentically leads us to the potential within. We need courage to examine our lives. Some of us fear doing it because we are afraid of what we will find. So... We deflect our attention with our phones and computers, TVs, or any other diversion we can find. Only when we look within, only when we are willing to look within, can we grow and make changes. When we make the choice to live an authentic life, we can see the spiritual powerhouses we truly are. Ralph Waldo Emerson put it thusly, to be yourself in a world that constantly 
is trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. Samuel Neff writes that as humans, we have a need to connect and we have a desire to be understood, to be heard and cared about. Connect, to connect, we must allow ourselves to be present. We must embrace not the face we show to the world, but the person we really are. Warts and all. When Mahatma Gandhi was asked what his message was to the Indian people, his response was, my life is my message. That is true for all of us. Our life is our message. While sharing that message with the world requires courage, the result will be extremely rewarding. Our bonus affirmation, today I choose to be open and vulnerable. I live an authentic life and connect on a deep level with those around me. I am blessed. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, when I was a kid, my mom spent um, a lot of time teaching us that um, it, it, a phrase that I heard somebody use recently, I didn't know anybody else knew it, but must. Uh, garbage in, garbage out. And my mom would say, you know, you're reading this book or you're looking at this or you're thinking this way. Um, she would say, you know, do you ever have a, a thought that you think, oof, where did that come from? And she said, you need to immediately look at that and say, nope, that's not where I'm going. And I mean, she spent a lot of time talking to us about that, which I really appreciated. Um, my mom was a, a great mentor. And um, <clears throat> so when she brought this song to me, she said, it's dumb. It's, I don't know, I don't think you should do it. And I said, no, I, I actually really like it, Mom. I like what it says. And it's very simple. It just says, listen to what you're thinking. Brent? Ready? Two. Oh, one, two, three, four. Are there some problems in your life? And you can't think what's causing you strife. If your life's not what is in the pink, it might be a result of how you think. Listen to what you're thinking. Listen to what you're thinking. Listen, and it might be a clue as to what's been happening to you. Look at that poor man crossing the street. He have no shoes upon his feet. Uh, looks like he needs some good food to eat. I'm glad he's not someone I have to meet. What do you mean this could happen to me? What do you say I should see him differently? What you're telling me seems very odd. You want me to see him as a child of God? Oh, listen to what you're thinking. Listen to what you're thinking. Listen, and it might be a clue as to what's been happening to you. See that woman over there? Oh, looks like she wears some weirdo hair. <laughs> see how she frowned when she see me stare? What? That's a mirror? That's not fair. Don't worry, I won't be judging you. What would really be a, that would be really a mean thing to do. You know why it's, you're getting off scot-free? Because I know you got that kind of thinking like me. <laughs> Listen to what you're thinking. Oh. Listen to what you're thinking. Listen, and it might be a clue as to what's been happening to you, Brent. What do I think when I'm looking at you? Well, 
I think there's plenty you could do. In fact, from my personal point of view, all these problems should be solved by you. Oh, think you're saying that I should have a part oh, in changing the world? Well, I'd have to start to see all these people so differently by seeing them all as God sees me. Listen to what you're thinking. Sing with me. Listen to what you're thinking. Listen, and it might be a clue as to what's been happening to you. One more time. Listen to what you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. Listen to what you're thinking. Listen, and you might have a clue as to what's been happening to you. What's been happening to you? What's been happening to you? I think it's good, Mom. <laughs> we are privileged this morning to have a much beloved speaker who has addressed us in the past many times. For those who who are new here, Reverend Don is our assistant minister. He's been ministering here since 2006, five. about five, and he is rip roaring and ready to tell you all about the four agreements and how you can improve your life by what you're going to be thinking. Reverend Don. <laughs> wow. Yeah. wow. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Listen to what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to what you're saying. Uh -huh. My goodness. Uh, glad you're all here. Good morning to y'all. I, uh, I think that um, you all must have uh, impeccable taste, <clears throat> especially in uh, what you choose to come here on a Sunday morning, because you came here this morning. So I'm glad you're here. Welcome, welcome. And I hope today we can meet your preferences, so to speak. Uh, Reverend Moore and Reverend Julie and I, we've been uh, meeting regularly every week. And we were talking about uh, last month, uh, t we wanted to discuss subjects that maybe things we could bring up in the way in, with our messages that would appeal to you. So we keep trying, we keep trying, we keep trying, we keep working on it. Um, and what happened, uh, we, <laughs> Reverend Judy brought up a little, she, she suggested a book. I tell you, I, I remember that when she suggested that. I, I read that book about 20 years ago, 20 years ago. And one, I, I didn't really get it. <laughs> I read it, uh, I read it actually piece, piecemeal. You know, you put something away, you think, well, I'll try it again. It seemed to be simple, being to be simple. Um, be peckable impeccable with your word uh that's, that's telling the truth isn't it duh i mean for god's sakes and then on and on same thing but i was into what i thought was more deep spiritual materials i was reading deepak chopra you know nothing about deepak chopra he's pretty pretty good and i was studying to be a minister at that time but after i became a minister about five years later i was straightening out my bookcase i'm going through the different books and i know you we've heard this happen before we've talked about it I, that book just literally fell at my feet. <laughs> yeah, I picked it up, and I had a second go round. And I've never forgot. I, I've never forgotten the lights that kind of came on as I dug into it the second time. So I don't know what's going to happen with you today. Maybe you've read the book. I think may, many of you have. Some have not. Perhaps you've already read it and decided to make up your own mind on its messages. But I'm just going to dig right in and. Uh, the Four Agreements was written, as you might know, by a modern-day Toltec shaman by the name of Don Miguel, Miguel Ruiz. Um, we had a reading by Catherine here earlier, just a few minutes ago, uh, about the power of vulnerability, and it spoke of allowing ourselves to be open and vulnerable, naked, if you will, shedding all these, these masks and false disguises that we wear that we show to the world and then summoning the courage to be impeccable with our life experiences. Uh, I believe this book discusses uh, four empowering life-enhancing agreements, and we can make 
those with ourselves and, and the world. It starts with us, always. I've been assigned the pleasure of beginning this whole wisdom idea of messaging and covering these first four agreements, titled the first one, that is, only, because what's going to happen is Reverend Julie and Reverend Cheryl, uh, Reverend Cheryl, Cheryl was our practitioner, who we call her Reverend Cheryl once in a while. Um, she is going to be, Cheryl, uh, that's Cheryl Guess, she's going to be presenting the last uh, uh, impeccable uh, agreement. But this first one, uh, impeccable with your word, I get thoughts about this. I get started on something that I think, no, 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 no. Taking a first glance, all of these four agreements seem to me to be, to be just basic advice. And, but after a depth of study, when you do some meditating, thinking about them, it's revealed how I think basic simplicity in spiritual practice doesn't have to be complicated. Yeah, that's what I've been getting out of it. We just have to be awake, aware, and have an understanding. Uh, be impeccable with your word. Those four agreements of uh, Toltec wisdom, they're ancient, but they're really relevant today if we just dig into them. And as we choose to live life, I think what we like to call it authentically. That's a word we use all the time. So we start with the first agreement. Be impeccable with your word. Now before... Um, we get into the impeccability, I think it'd be beneficial to take a peek uh, into the background of this ancient beginnings of where these teachings come from, the Toltec wisdom of long ago. Now, according to the author, uh, Don Miguel, thousands of years ago, he says, the Toltec peoples were known throughout southern Mexico as women and men of knowledge art and spiritual sciences. Now, if you do a little Google research, <laughs> and I did that, the, anthrop the anthropologists have sp spoken of the Toltecs as just another nation or a race that uh, categorizes them with the civilizations that were taking care of South America, Lower Mexico, Central America, the Mayans and the Incas, uh, the Aztecs, and the overall Toltec history that's there. Uh, but the thing I've decided to do, I'm, I'm not going to have any of the discussions of uh, the whole thing like the human sacrifices, that, that have come, the sacrificial maidens being thrown into volcanoes, <laughs> the that things that, that uh, we see uh, Hollywood coming up with sometimes when they're depicting these characters, uh, the ancient Mayans and so on, Aztecs. So... <coughs> I'd like to just kind of go into the hard teaching of this ancient terminology. The Toltec language has its own inclination to, to speak in a way that we have to think about. It, uh, it's got its own terminology uh, to describe the spiritual practices of, of human healing. Words like black magic, white magic, words that to the modern ear sound a bit like superstitions, that kind of thing. But terms understood in the Toltec language, in their perspective, regards spirit and human endeavor, not superstitions. And Don Miguel makes a statement that, in fact, the Toltecs were scientists and artists and that formed a society to explore and conserve these, this what they call the spiritual knowledge and the ancient practices for the benefit of healing of humans, the healing of mind, body, and spirit. And he writes that they came together as masters, or in their language they call the word uh, nagwals, nagwals, they were dedicated lifetime students when they got into it. Uh, they lived in that ancient city in that time of, uh, if I can pronounce it, Tawoti Waka, to, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> Tawoti Kahwan or something like that, in a, a city in, of pyramids outside of southern Mexico. There were pyramids. They're known as the place, they had this title given to it, it was the place where man becomes God. Hmm. So the book he wrote also claims that over the whole millennia of time, the Nagual's were forced to conceal all that ancestral wisdom and maintain its existence in obscurity for a reason, mainly because of the European conquests. 
um, the uh, conquistadors brought in a whole different kind of a religion, so to speak. Uh, so the healing power that they had, that white magic they counted on, uh, sometimes was turned into what was called black magic by them. And some of the novices who took it over introduced it for abuse and personal gain. They got interested in it because it wasn't being guarded. So they talked about white magic in Toltec means having the impeccability of healing, while black magic dealt in personal power, sleight of hand, the darkness of human intentions so to control others and to gain wealth and position. Not a whole lot different than uh, <laughs> the lesser human behaviors of today, when you think about it. Um, so it was shielded, uh, shielded from the uh, majority of the populace, and like the esoteric knowledge of other ancient practices, it was passed on very carefully through different lineages of these uh, trusted ones, they call themselves, the Nogwals, N-A-U-G-U-A-L-S. I know this is fascinating stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Well, supposedly, <laughs> these teachings remained veiled for secrecy for hundreds of years, while all the time there was prophecies coming up that would come for, forth every genera generation that would tell about it would, what time would be coming when it would be necessary to return this wisdom to the people. And as I read that statement, the coming of an age when it would be necessary to return the wisdom to the people, I think of these days, right now, what's going on. We could use more impeccableness, impeccableness in our word today, I think. In our high tech, in our sophisticated computer sciences, for example, my gosh, where we have these blessings of communications with others all over the world, what it's evolved to where impeccable is not the case in our communications and our information gathering all the time. We know that. Miscommunication and domination and falsehood purposely uh, used and presented to influence the false to be true and vice versa. It's so much conflict along with our uh, any beneficial connections we've had. That's all mixed in there. The word impeccable is kind of absent from many parts of it, I think. Hmm. And what I think is important, of course. Miscommunication, domination, yeah. We're now at a juncture, really we are. We're at a juncture when all must use investigative caution of much of what invades our technical space. I don't know how many times I've changed my, uh, my safety of my <laughs> computer uh, with warnings and so on. And, and something else though, this, this is more important to me. I think it's very telling very impactive that trust is being eroded in truth even though we want it. And it's not always the words case when we hear the chatter of today, especially out there in the internet. And then another thing, religious, religion's trust. Speaking of religious trust, as a minister and a servant of the spiritual teaching we call religious science here, ah, uh, I've seen surveys late in my later years here, surveys and research that's increasing. It says right now that uh, 45 plus percent of our populace of this country claims they want no affiliation or desire to associate with any particular religion uh, or other religious organization, but the however comes in, they are seeking something else that can make sense to them. Uh-huh, something that they feel trustworthy, even uncomplicated. Mm-hmm, I know what that feels like. I've gone through that. And still, they want to have something that they can embrace their spiritual need for spirituality, free from fear of not being enough. That's one of the things that comes upon us in our human experiences, this needing, not feeling enough. So when I see that, I wonder, I ponder, maybe it's time to return to the wisdom of simplicity and a direct responsible behavior that you can put your finger on that would appeal to a, a majority of open-minded, willing-hearted individuals that we, we are who are looking for something that makes 
beneficial sense to them. Does no harm to others. Have you heard what we, how we speak about this teaching of religious science? It's been spoken of as being deeper than an ocean, wider than a galaxy, deep enough so that any deep thinker, the deepest thinker can get something out of it, but, but safe enough that children can play along its shores. And the reason for that is because we don't preach any kind of fear, teach any kind of fear. We don't go down that road. So, uh, <laughs> ah, gosh, impeccable with our word. And because we're encouraged in our faith to be open at the top, I can stand here and talk about something clear off from our major philosophy and uh, with an open heart not feel like, oh gosh, I'm deserting my faith. To be open to the top is to be not afraid to widen our knowledge in the spiritual sciences that teach light, love, and self-growth and acceptance. And so I saw some of that as I went, started going through the whole book. And it's just so much there that you can't, in one message, give it all. So I hope to make some sense in, in sharing uh, this morning, just maybe a, a fraction of what appeals to me about this first agreement, being impeccable with your word. That first agreement, is said by some who have explored the, its true meaning to be the most important one, but also the most difficult to honor. And, and the book tells us that there's an uh, ancient perspective which supports that belief. That perspective uh, tells us it's one of the most difficult to honor because all of our lives, all of our lives begin, began, with what the Toltec wisdom describes as a collective dream. A collective dream. It just sounded so weird when I first was reading that. The Toltecs see life as, as a dream that is perpetuated by first appearances and what we have been taught and what we've been programmed. In fact, what Don Miguel says is that what we are seeing and hearing right now, what you're seeing and hearing right now, is nothing but a dream. Hmm. A perpetuation of a world dreaming, but it's not only my personal intimate or your personal intimate dream, but rather it was a dream that was created by the human family before us, contributing to a big, big outside dream that we can call society's dream or the dream of the planet. Doesn't it sound kind of interesting, weird? Perhaps we could call it the overdream, it's my own thoughts on that, sort of like Emerson's de Declaration of the Oversoul, but untethered to the soul and tangled up in the collective consciousness of the race of mankind's accumulation of believing in this and believing in that and then fear being the flag bearer a lot of the time. And of course humanity makes up the collective dream of billions and billions of smaller personal dreams and yes, some of it with great vision and promise. But together, as we began our human life journeys, we were born into the dream of a family, the dream of a community and a, and a country, uh, uh, and finally a dream that holds the great illusion of the whole you of all humanity. And this dream of the planet includes all of the rules, society's rules, the beliefs, the laws, the laws of the land, the rules and the laws of its religions, its various cultures and the ways that we're expected to be. Its influence, it influences us along our path to adulthood and the larger overarching dream of fitting in. We got to be a part of that puzzle that makes up the whole that is contributing to society's good. And most of the time, we didn't choose those beliefs. And the way we, many times, we've rebelled against them even as we were growing through into adulthood. There's a reason why there's a period of our life when we must rebel. There's a faint little something in us that says, wait a minute. But in the whole picture of our being influenced by the dreams language from our parents, we agreed enough to develop a system. You and I have a belief system. And out of our programming, there's something developed in the human psyche. Every human psyche finds it and that it, it fears rejection. 
It fears rejection, not being accepted. We hear so much non-impeccable language, <laughs> words designed and intended to control us and influence us. They're wonderful, interesting advertisements we get. We're going to watch the, the football game later today, and wow, aren't we going to be entertained well with all the advertising commercials? <laughs> We're going to find entertainment in them. They're going to influence us, though. There's a number of us that are going to buy that car. We're going to get that. Yeah, we're going to do it. That's okay. But this idea that's developed that fears rejection, our parts, the parts to help us is what we're looking for. Things are calling on us to speak our words of service. But much of our words we speak and hear come out of the unconscious intentions learned from being ignorant of the power that we wield with our language. We think we know about it, but you have to think about it. There's power in our words and ignorantly harmful sometimes out of the ignorance. Don Miguel shares the ancient perspective that we're never guilty of anything we do in ignorance, truly. We're only speaking from our programming, from the false perspective dream teachings that surround us. And if, and if we can see this, uh, we're born with a capacity to, to learn, to dream. And the humans who live before us teach us in various ways how to fit into this matrix of human behaviors. That's what it's all about. And dream into the society's dreams, the way society dreams, the one we were born into. If I was... If I lived in Japan, I would have that, of course. If I live here, I'd have this, of course. And therefore, right down, it comes right down to the language that we use to communicate, creating out of and with our words, the power and the creative energy found in our words. Without words that make up language, we could not be a society. We couldn't be a culture. We couldn't be a family. Language is the code for understanding and communicating between humans, really. The only way to transfer and collect information and the only way to store information, the only way to store it is the words must, that, we, that we've spoken and heard. We have to have an agreement made to those words. If we don't agree, we don't store information. It's that simple. A person convinced against their will is still unconvinced still. So. See, if we don't store information in a believing way, a solid way, then we can't develop faith. Faith, to have faith is to believe unconditionally. Unconditionally. That's the main way we learn as children. That's it. We believe in the dream language details of our parents and others who engage us with their words to then become responsible for our words, no longer ignorant of their power, and our enlightened task, we have a task here, we have a responsibility here, is to seek the meaning of how we can be impeccable with our words and not sow discord or do emotional harm to others from ignorant speaking. In one sense, it may seem to us that making impeccable words would always just tell the truth. That, that covers it well. But as we think deeper into the meaning of being impeccable with our words, what we decide not to say is just as powerful as what we do say. Uh -huh. Especially in regards to words about other people. Now we're getting to it, folks. In black magic slash white magic, terms of Toltec wisdom, it's spoken of how we and others have the power to put spells upon one another with words. Looking at everyday human interactions, just imagine, Take this for a moment. Imagine that how many times we may have cast spells on each other with our word. Over time, this interaction has become the worst form of black magic. And as we spiritually become aware, we have a name for it. With this power of words, we recognize it. We call it out. Gossip. Gossip. <laughs> the book tells us that gossip is poison. The Toltecs... Uh, uh, called it as one way that we succumb to dabbling with black magic. Nothing is healing with gossip. We learned how to gossip when we were children. We heard the adults around us gossiping freely, 
per, uh, openly judging and, and, and opinionating about other people. Have I ever told you the joke? <laughs> Let me see if I've got it here. My favorite gossip joke? You may have heard of this before, but I have to tell you this. It just gets to me. It's about Mildred, the uh, church gossip. She lived in a small town, wonderful little church. The town had one grocery, one gas station, one bar next to the grocery, had the only public telephone in the bar. Some days, days ago, we used to use pay phones. Remember that? <laughs> You know, when, I, when cell phones came out, I always said, I don't need a cell phone. There's a pay phone in every corner. Every corner? Where do you see a pay phone in every corner now, right? Okay, so Mildred the Church Gossip, the self-appointed monitor of the church's morale, morals, she kept sticking her nose into other people's business. Several members did not approve of her extracurricular activities, but feared her enough to maintain their silence. She made a mistake, however when she accused the new member of the church, Gerald, after she saw his old pickup truck parked in front of the uh, town's only bar. She knew what he was in there for. He was in making a call to his brother on the only f public phone in town, but she didn't know that. So she emphatically told Gerald and everyone nearby at the church at coffee hour that everyone who saw it parked it, that pickup park there would know what he was doing. Well, Gerald, a man of few words, stared at her for a moment and just turned away and walked away. Didn't explain, didn't defend or deny. He said nothing. Later that evening, George quietly parked his truck in front of Mildred's house, <laughs> and walked home, <laughs> left it there all night. <laughs> gossip, gossip. Da Don Miguel, in his book, asks a very insightful question for us to ponder. <laughs> he says, consider how many times we may have gossiped about the person we love the most just to gain support of others for our point of view, in order maybe perhaps to make our opinions right. Gossip's not a tool for communication, as some folks have used it. It's a weapon. It is. It's a weapon. And many times, gossiping becomes the main form of communication in the human society. There's an old expression that says, misery loves company, and behavior uh, gossiping makes the gossip feel better to see someone else feel as badly as they do, or, or seeking judgments with the gossip's uh, own judgments. Our computer-like minds is what we can say about that. Gossiping can be compared to a computer virus. Mm-hmm. The computer virus has a harmful intention. Uh, the impeccable word spoken has no intention or of harm or criticism. But gossip is like poison to the speaker as well as the gossiped about when you think about that. This first agreement of the four sets the healing stages in human behavior because it establishes an energy for those giving and receiving it in trustworthiness, the trust. Say what I mean and mean what I say, and take care of how and what I say, right? If we can put our intentions and attentions to understand what the word is and what the word does, we then engage the next step in our favorite affirmation that we say here over and over here. You hear it all the time. Change your thinking, change your life. We say that here often, but the next important step from the quality of our thoughts is to start the action and the speaking of our word is the next step, what we say. Speaking our word makes our thoughts become form that lets others take a peek into our inner self. Yeah. It's where we're feeling and stirring the pot of possibility for positive action if we do it right. With our words, we make our agreements. You bet. And uh, even exchange our feelings and our actions with our words. And to do so in truth, in truth, and do no harm, but using unconditional love. Do we know what that even means? Unconditional love? I just love you. But is it unconditionally? Or do you have to do something? Unconditional love. Mm. And do it in truth. And do no harm. 
Then we continue our journey of building situations to create worlds that we speak about, which can work and benefit all. When we can trust what words tell us on the surface from the speaker and not have to dodge and dart through our feelings of untrust, and it can be reversed and they can do the same with us, then suspicion transforms into confident action and the quality of our emotional life becomes a carrier of joy. Telling the truth is not only about revealing cracks and faults or unworthiness. Truth spoken from impeccable intentions to heal and help and love, unconditionally love, breaks all the barriers and brings down the walls of mistrust from those who come to know us as one who speaks words of impeccability. When I tell you something, I'm telling you my heart, and it, can I believe a heart more than an emotion that's called a human emotion out of anger and etc. You know, there's, no, there's nothing gained out of, of uh, getting angry when you smash your finger with a hammer like I did the other day. <laughs> Swear words, they come out sometimes, you know. <laughs> Do the ever. <laughs> um, well, I have to close here. I can't go anymore. But there's so, so much more ab about this. You're going to hear some good stuff coming up from uh, Reverend Julie and, and Practitioner Cheryl in the next couple Sundays. Be here and hear what they have to say about these next words of wisdom from the Book of the Four Agreements. You're not going to be disappointed, I'm sure. So I'll close this down by saying thank you for being here, and uh, we'll see if anything came out of this today or not. I, 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 I feel like a win in circles, but it feels okay. It feels okay. Thanks. Okay. okay. Thank you. Now, Actually got it out of a, a book, an audio book, so that I could listen to it in my car as I went to work. And um, so I listened to it, and I listened to it, and I thought, you know, what what speaks? And the interesting listening to him talk about it. One of the things that came clearly to me was that um, knowing that you you can't make agreements unless you know who you are and what your statement of being is. And the words that come from your mouth are the words, as my mother said, of what you're thinking. Um, but they are also the words of what we believe of ourselves and of our world. And so one of the things that came to me was this beautiful secular song that is oh so not secular. Um, but people think of it that way. On a clear day rise and look around you okay i'll do that and you'll see see who you
have to tell you that when we were leaving the hospital, one of the things they said about Brent is that to not be um, concerned, he may not be able to play piano again. Oh. <laughs> Those were not impeccable words. <laughs> we are glad that not every word spoken turns out to be a prophecy of the future. <laughs> Even by medical professionals, it doesn't happen. What happens is the heart expresses itself as it will and, and as it is supported to do by those in the community immediately. Now I'm thinking of our community, yes, but I'm thinking of these two people, yeah. Darcy and Brent, yeah. how much love they support one another. And I, I'm going to share a secret, Mark. Okay. You told me. Go ahead. All right. She <laughs> said, the doctor said this, this, this gentleman, this, it won't happen. He's not coming back. And she said, no, he's coming back, and I'm here to see that he does. And that's the truth. So we share in the power of the word. We share in the power of life. We share in the power of love. We do that by speaking our words, by being impeccable, and by taking action. And when we take action, the words that we have in our minds and our hearts take form. And this form, right now, we're talking about money. <laughs> we have the opportunity to express ourselves and give ourselves. I have two of them, but I don't remember did the other one. Oh, well. We'll do four. We'll go ahead. Yes. Yes. So, please, let's read our story, uh, statement together. You see it in the program. Divine love, love moving in, in and, and through me, me blesses, blesses and multiplies and all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God. We're singing now. All right. In your program, you have it there. Bless it always. Called Bless it always. Bless it always. Bless it always. Bless it always. Go ahead. of life is such a precious gift, given so freely by the infinite to so many, and given most importantly to each of us. We accept this gift. We accept all it symbolizes, all that it means to us, in our loved ones, our family, our church family. We accept the gift of life and we share it. We share it freely. And so we give thanks for every gift shared today because they're all a gift of life. This is the truth. And so it is. Let us pray. And so it is. We now uh, would like to share a special prayer. If you'd like to stand for this one, the prayer of protection. The words are in the program. And then we'll sing our peace song. 
The light light of of God God surrounds surrounds us. us. The The love love of God God enfolds us. us. The The power of God God protects us. us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is and all is well. We can join hands across the aisles even if you check No guessing. <laughs>